Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gort and I want to thank you for joining with me today. Today we come to our third in the series on John's Gospel and I've called this series Believing Gives Life. So today please join with me if you have Bibles we will turn to John chapter 3. As we begin, let's give this time over to God in prayer. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, what we can learn from it. And we pray that you'll help us to do that today. Change in our lives what needs to be changed to match how you want us to live. In your name we pray. Amen. So John chapter 3. Now, when I just say John chapter 3 to you, you might think immediately, I know that story. And I know that somewhere in John chapter 3, there is that famous verse, John 3, verse 16. And that's actually the last verse in what we're going to be looking at today. But I wonder, have you ever experienced a role reversal? Maybe uh, you've been the breadwinner in your home and you have worked for 60 years and now you've retired. Role reversal. Every day you went to work, now you're at home. Or maybe you've been the breadwinner for many years, no matter how long, and now you're at home and your spouse is becoming the breadwinner. A role reversal. Or sometimes when my children uh, were younger in primary school, there would be a role reversal in the class that if a child had done something really, really good or had done great work, the teacher would allow the child that did the great things to teach the class. And the teacher would sit down and pretend to be a student. A role reversal. And maybe you can think of role reversals that have happened in books or movies. We know what role reversals are about. A role reversal is when there is a change, there is a U-turn, there is almost a change of 180 degrees, a complete turnaround. It's a totally new way of looking at something. And I think we see this today in John chapter 3, in the series Believing Gives Life. Now as we've started this series and we look that John's Gospel is different compared to the other, he chooses stories to tell to give a specific reason and story for it. And here he does it because Jesus came to give a role reversal, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. John 20 verse 31 is our theme verse. And that verse reminded us that he tells us these things so that we may believe. Why, why did the Jews and the Gentiles need to hear about these role reversals? Why today do we need to hear about these role reversals? Well, John says the answer is simple. So that you, that I, may believe. In our first week, we saw the role reversal where Jesus, the light, came to the world which was dark. Light into darkness, that's a role reversal. The second week we saw that Jesus challenged the Jewish people and their idea of the Messiahship and purification rituals and their religiousness connected to the marriage ceremony. Now, he came and said, I'm better than all of it. Now, great that you're trying to hold on to it, but why hold on to what is good when you've got the best? So he gives a role reversal. Why? So that the Jews would believe. That they would understand who he is. And we don't know, from what we've seen in chapters 1 and 2 and get to chapter 3, whether Nicodemus, which is in chapter 3, whether he'd seen Jesus or heard a lot about Jesus, but I think he probably had heard some of his teaching. Because in verse 2 we read this, For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So I think he does know Jesus in some way. He's heard, he's seen, as he said, the signs. 
And remember, in John's Gospel, I said the first 12 chapters, we can break them up and call it the book of signs. Nicodemus says to Jesus, you know, I've heard about signs. Well, what do we learn? Well, in this story of Nicodemus, Jesus is going to challenge him to have a role reversal. And as he tells him about these role reversals, the challenge obviously is, would he respond? Going back to our theme verse, will Nicodemus believe? Will the Jews and Gentiles hearing this story believe? Will we today believe? Because Jesus brings these role reversals, not just to the Jews and Gentiles around 90 AD, but to our culture as well. And the first thing we need to do when we come to chapter 3 is, let's meet Nicodemus. Well, verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Well, there's a whole lot to unpack here in verse 1. Now, Nicodemus, it's a Greek name, but he was definitely a Jew. He's a member of the Jewish ruling council, which is the Sanhedrin, and he's a rabbi, a teacher. We get that later, actually, in verse 10. And he's a Pharisee to boot. In a way, Nicodemus sounds a bit like the Apostle Paul, doesn't he? Now, he's the Jewish of Jews. Now, remember. When we came to look at this, and we're looking at all these signs in chapters 1 to 12, John takes the uh, Jewish relig religious festivals, he takes the institutions that they hold on to, he takes what Gentiles hold on to, their religious festivals, and in the midst of this, he says to them that Jesus is better. And we get that here. You know, here is one of the most important things for the Jewish people, is understanding being a Pharisee a, on the Sanhedrin, but particularly here for chapter 3, more importantly, the religious institution of the teacher, the rabbi. And he comes with a question, though the question may not be that obvious. In verse 2, let me read to you the whole of verse 2 and see if you can think about what the question might be. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, so one rabbi talking to another. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Can you see the implicit question? He doesn't come and out and, out and ask the question, but the implicit question is, no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. He has come to Jesus and said, I've seen what you've done. I've heard what you've taught. Are you God? Are you the Messiah? Now, we know last week when we looked at the wedding at Cana, they were attending the wedding, and as all Jewish people would do, spiritually they were waiting for the Messiah because he would turn up at a wedding banquet. Jesus turns up, waves his head, does the miracle and says, you're waiting for the Messiah? Here I am. I think Nicodemus was getting that. He was understanding and he's come to Jesus. He comes at night and asks him the implicit question, are you God? Are you from God? And this is where we start to see the role reversals. Look at Jesus' response in verse 3. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The role reversal here is that anyone, everyone has the possibility of entering the kingdom of God. Now the, the statement or the phrase kingdom of God uh, doesn't appear uh, in the Old Testament or but the Jewish people did have this idea that when the Messiah would come, God's kingdom, this new kingdom, would be there. There would be peace, they would rule the world, and this kingdom was only for them. 
it was only for the Jews. Now, is that what verse 3 says? Very truly I tell you, only Jews will see the kingdom of God. No. Very truly I tell you, this is actually what it says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus takes the teaching that the Jews had and he reverses it. The teaching, it is only for us Jews, he reverses that. It's not just for the Jews, it is for anyone. Anyone can enter the kingdom of God. What does verse 3 say? They just need to be born again. Now this role reversal, it's huge. And Nicodemus hears it, thinks about it, and you can see by his response, he, he's blown away by it. And he says to Jesus, how, how can I go back? You know, he's thinking of physical birth. He says, how can I redo it? How can I be reborn? He's thinking about it physically, not spiritually. And even after Jesus responds, verse 9, Nicodemus responds again and says, how, how can this be? He says. Now I think Jesus here sees his honest questioning. And so he goes back to the Old Testament. Remember Nicodemus, the Jewish of Jews, a Pharisee, part of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. Okay, he knows their history. He knows the Old Testament front ways and back ways. He knows it all. But Jesus sees his honest and open questioning. And so he goes back into the Old Testament to explain it. And when he does, he gives another role reversal. The role reversal we see here is and you are actually not saved by religion. You're going to be saved by a person. Let me read to you verse 14 to 16. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now I think when Nicodemus hears this about Moses lifting this, uh, the, the rod and everything like that, he instantly understands. Okay, He knows his Jewish heritage. He knows Israel's history. He knows that when Israel uh, were in the wilderness, or actually, sorry, in Egypt, they cried out to God for help and he raised Moses to lead them out of Egypt. God calls this people, the Jewish people, to call them Israel. And he says, I've got a land for you. And he leads them to the promised land. Now, the journey to the promised land should have taken just a couple of weeks, but it ends up taking 40 years. It takes them 40 years to get there because they're disobedient. And during that 40 years, God provided protection from their enemies. He gave them food. He gave them water. And what was Israel's response? For 40 years, their response was to grumble. God gave them food. It wasn't enough food. There was too much food. It was the same food every day. And they got bored of it. They said, we need something to drink. So God gave them water, but it wasn't enough water. It didn't taste nice water. And again, even though God protected and provided everything for them, all they did was grumble. So God punishes them. He brought these snakes that would bite them. And if you were bitten, you would die. Now, Israel thought, well, we'll just keep trying to work, sort the situation out ourselves. And they didn't really give lip service to God. And lots of them died. They then realized, we can't do this ourselves. We need God's help. They cried out to God. Now, did God take away the snakes? No, he didn't. What he did do was he said to Moses, I want you to grab a, a pole or a staff. And on top of it, I want you to put a figurine or a little statue, a symbol representing a snake, a serpent. And so Moses did that. And then he said to Moses, I want you to walk through the camp and anyone who is bitten, if they look up 
at the staff. They look up at the statue of the serpent on top of the staff, then they will be healed. But if you walk through and they don't look up because they think they can do it themselves, then they're still going to die. And the snake still bit people, and some died, and some looked to the staff and were saved. Basically, what it was about was this was something that was given by God. God had told him that if you do this, just by looking up at something I have given you, said God, it says to me that you trust me, that you are obedient and you believe what I've said, and I will forgive you. You will not die from the poison. All they had to do was look up, see what God had done, and be forgiven. Sadly, lots still died, but others were forgiven. Now, the Jewish leader Nicodemus here, he knew all that. Now, it's part of his history, it's part of his story. But look at how Jesus reverses it. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up. We know that this side of the cross, that when it talks about Jesus being lifted up, uh, it's talking about his death on the cross. Jesus reverses the story, but it's the same ending. The very simple thought was that the people uh, back in their Jewish times just had to look up at the staff, look at the serpent. God would forgive and they would live. Here it is very simple. It's exactly the same thing. Look up at what God has given, Jesus dying on the cross. And in that process, if you look up and you believe, then God will forgive. And you are eternally saved. You eternally have new life. But this is a radical role reversal for Nicodemus. He's not saved by being a Jew. He's not saved by the Jewish religion. He's not saved by being a rabbi. He's not saved by holding on and grasping to the Jewish institutions or the Jewish festivals. He's not saved by coming back at this stage, the temple still exists. He is not coming back and, seeing a few computer problems there, sorry about that. Uh, so he comes back I'm just going to have to try to fix something, sorry. What is going on? There we go. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened there. Some weird things. Lost my camera. Uh, but the role reversal that he needed to understand is that it's not saved by any of that. Okay. What he's saved by is God's son. He's saved by just looking up at the cross, believing in what Jesus did, and that was it. A radical role reversal. And I think Nicodemus understood this. Later on, we meet him again twice in John's Gospel. We meet him in chapter 7, where he stands up to defend Jesus. And we meet him again in chapter 19, where he's there with Joseph to bury Jesus. So I think Nicodemus understands these role reversals. Now, the people that John was writing to at 90 AD, they needed to hear this and they needed to understand. They needed to realize as they were trying to hold on to these religious festivals or start them again, that they didn't actually need them. What they really needed to do is just look up. They just needed to see the Son of Man up on, on the cross. And if they believe, just looking up and believe, they would be saved. Now the Gentiles, the same thing. They were trying, as far as religion went, you know, they just took anything from anywhere and everywhere. But they didn't know whether they would be saved. They lived life as though they didn't care really what happened. But all they had to do is exactly the same thing. Just look up. Have faith. Have belief in what Jesus did. And be saved. The same as it was in the desert. Just look up and see the serpent on the pole. 
look up and see the Son of God. That's all they had to do. What do we do? Because it's exactly the same for us. Now, when we think about our situation today, do we think that we are okay in what we do? You know, live life how we want? Do we think we actually need God or not? Do we think that, yeah, maybe I do want to respond to God, but I'll do that later in life. Oh, if we think about this story for the Jewish people, God didn't take away the serpents, did he? And they didn't know when they were going to get bitten. But once they were bitten, they just had to look up. For us, we don't know when we will stand before God. But we do know we need to make a choice before that to look up and be saved. Have you done that? Have our family, our friends, our workmates, our schoolmates, have they done that? And do we think that there are actually many ways to enter the kingdom of God? For the Jewish people, they think it's just for them. But Jesus comes along and says, Roll reversal! It's actually for everyone. Do we realize that? Or sometimes do we put our own man-made rules or whatever it might be that changes things where we say who can enter the kingdom of God instead of what Jesus says. Jesus says, just look up, believe, and you enter the kingdom of God. Do we get in the way of that? And do we change the message? Do we tell forget to tell people to look at Jesus and try to tell them about just God's love and that they don't need to respond or whatever it might be just to make the message more palatable? Or do we honestly say, just look up and believe? You know, we need to understand these role reversals. We need to understand them because religion doesn't save. Being a Jew didn't save. Being a Baptist doesn't save. What saves is a person. A person who was lifted up so that we could just look and believe. Now I wonder if any of you know of David Wallace. He was a pretty famous person. He got known as the bravest man in the world. Back in the late 90s, I think around 1997, uh, up in the uh, northern part of the state of New South Wales, uh, he became famous because he was a truck driver. And at the end of the school holidays, he was taking his uh, son, who I think was 10 or 11 at the time, uh, on a trip to Brisbane to drop things off. Uh, there was an accident. The truck rolled and burst into flames. When all the emergency people got there, they could hear the son crying out and yelling in the accident. And what happened was, and why he had been called the bravest man in the world, was that he had laid his body across his son to protect him in the accident. Now, sadly, the truck burst into flames and uh, his father died. The son suffered minor burns, but lived. And when you hear a story like this, it can bring a tear to your eye. And I've been thinking... Uh, about this just recently because we've been hearing about lots and lots of truck accidents, particularly up in our area. But it gets you to think about the response, doesn't it? And I think when we look at and we think about the love shown by the Father, now we have a picture of that sort of love here, but way better. Now the famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is not a father dying for his son. Now, that's love. That's David Wallace. That's not what we're here about. But here we have a father asking his son to die for complete strangers. Well, actually not just complete strangers, but their enemy. Now, that's not just love. That's unfathomable love. How will you respond to that? How will I respond to that? How will, and if you say, I already love and follow Jesus, I've already looked up and I've been saved. Brilliant. But do you actually share that unfathomable love with others? 
because many people in our world know nothing about it. How can we share that this week? When we think about that unfathomable love, please today, don't leave with it just up here as head knowledge, but leave with it as a role reverse. That your heart has been reversed, that you no longer just live for yourself, but that you follow Jesus. Role reversals in everyday physical life are big, but the biggest spiritual role reversal is the biggest of all. Have you responded to Jesus? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, help us to understand these role reversals. And in this, Lord, we just ask that you will through your spirit, show us our standing with you. And Lord, if we do love and follow you, if we've looked up and seen the lifted up sun, Father, help us to share that same love with those around us. So Lord, we ask that you guide us in this today in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with me today. Sorry for the short hiccup. Don't know what happened with the computer and camera. Hopefully it won't happen again, uh, but thank you very much. And I'll look forward to catching up with you again next week, where we'll probably jump in to John chapter 4. God bless to you and your family this week. See you then.